Because according to Genesis chapter 12, the Lord said to Abram, I will make you a blessing. And watch what he says. He says, and I will bless those that bless you. Isn't it wonderful? How many know God is wonderful? How many know Jesus is wonderful? And isn't it wonderful that when God determined to bless the earth, he decided to choose you and I to be the blessing? That's what makes him so wonderful. That in one time of our life, we were not a blessing. Look at your neighbor and you might have known their past. You're like, oh, oh. And you look over at them and say, I don't know if this guy was a blessing. I don't know if this girl's a blessing. But look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He's turned them into a blessing. Oh, man, it's powerful. He's chosen us. It's wonderful to know that God chooses people like us. Now, you might be here this morning and say, well, pastor, that's good for you. You're blessed. You're highly favored. You've been serving the Lord now a long time. And you say, pastor, I don't have much to give. And I want to challenge you. Take a second look at your life. Take a closer look. Take a second look at where you are because we all have something to give. Just touch your neighbor and tell them we all got something. Remember when God called me to be a blessing, it was early in my walk. And to be truthful, I didn't have much to give. I didn't have much to give. You you might relate with that. I had a hard time seeing myself as being a blessing. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I had a tendency to be selfish. That was my issue. I think I needed deliverance from alcohol. I needed deliverance from a bunch of sins in my life. But one of the biggest deliverances I need was the deliverance of selfishness. I had a tendency to be selfish. And I heard someone say that when a man is wrapped up in self, he makes for a pretty small package. I think it's so important to change because selfishness leads to self-destruction. And early in my walk, God said to me, you're going to be a blessing. And, and I had to start somewhere, just like some of you this morning. God is saying, you're going to be a blessing. I'm going to use your life. But you, you got to start somewhere. You got to start out somewhere. And how many know sometimes we start out small? We start out small. But then as we practice giving and we practice being a blessing, we begin to grow. We begin to enlarge and we begin to grow personally. There's a few things that you could look at your life this morning that you have. The first thing that we all have is we all have time. We all have time. Sometimes setting aside time for others is a blessing. Can I get a little bit of your time? Can you spend some time with me? See, the best helping hand you'll ever find is at the end of your own arm. In the beginning, that's all I had was time. (laughs) I had nothing but time on my hands and I decided that I was going to use that time for God I remember picking up people for church using my own gas I was that guy I was that guy if you needed a ride to church you call out back then we didn't have cell phones we had the phones on the wall with the long cord come on somebody and I lived with my mom and my grandma and they said Al the phone is ringing it's for you and I already knew what the call was hey can you pick me up from church And it didn't matter where they lived. I'd go and pick them up to get them to the house of God. I was that guy. I was that guy. If you needed a ride, call me. I think they called me because they knew I wasn't going to charge them for gas. I wasn't going to get them in the car and say, you got five on it? No, no. I just said, jump in, man. Let's give ourselves to God. Let's serve Jesus. I'm excited about what God is doing in my life. We all have time. and, And many times when we would talk and take time to drive in the car and spend go to church and spend the evening together we'd encourage one another talking people through their struggles you know giving out advice i didn't even know if i had the right advice at the time but i just determined i was going to encourage somebody a lot of times we need encouragement ourselves but don't you know there's nothing more encouraging than taking the time to encourage someone else when you speak life into others somehow life begins to spring up in you Somehow, I think even when we're discouraged and we begin to encourage others, it's not like we're talking to them. It's like we're talking to ourselves, too. Come on now. You're going to make it. Everything's going to be all right. The marriage is going to get better. And somehow your own spirit gets stirred up. We all have something to give. I remember staying up late, late at diners. We would go to diners, shut down the restaurant, be there, have a meal and you know, just talk and enjoy those times together and encourage one another. Back when we were young, we could eat anything. 
can't do that so much anymore. <laughs> you know, you got to watch what you eat now. But when you're young, you eat all kinds of chili stuff and hot stuff. And we'd be just grubbing fries with all kinds of different toppings. Come on now. And just talk into the midnight hour and enjoying the presence of God together. Come on, church. Who's had those experiences? And sometimes those things weren't always convenient. Sometimes you got to get up when you didn't want to and drive when you didn't want to and stay out later than you wanted to. You might have had a meeting in the morning or be at 5 a.m. prayer meeting, but it didn't matter. You would stay up all until 2 in the morning encouraging somebody, using your time. That was my gift. We all have something to give. What about our talent? What about our talent? You know, God told me you're going to be a blessing. And I, I determined that I may not have had money, but I had some time and, you know, I, w I was willing to serve. I, I wasn't say I, I wouldn't say I was the most gifted person because I wasn't. I'm still not. I wasn't the most gifted. I was on a journey of, of discovering my gifts. But as I begin to discover, I begin to realize that gifts and talents are God's deposit in our personal account. When God gives you a gift and God gives you a talent, God says, I'll never take it away. It's irrevocable. I look out here and I see people with gifts and talents and abilities and things that are even still hidden and locked up inside of you that you have not discovered. And the good news is God put it there. God put it there. I don't know when. I don't know when. If you were in your mother's womb or when it, when it came in, all I know it's there. There's something inside of you that God can use. And as I was on that journey to discover my discover and develop my talent. I got involved in any area that could help out. I, I just said, man, you know, I, God has done so much in my life and I've turned my back on the world and, and I got some time and I want to give it to people and I want to give my time to the church. I want to, I want to serve, man. If I, if the church could be open every day, I'll be there. Yeah. If it means to just be there and clean toilets or wipe down a countertop or or, or, you know, help in the church. I want to do it. I remember my first ministry was the sound ministry. And they didn't let me run the sound. They didn't let me touch the board. They're like, no, don't touch the board, man. You know, you don't got the skills. So I said, well, what could I do? They said, what you could do is you could set up the microphones. So I remember just being so excited for the Lord. And God said, you're going to be a blessing. And I would just come up on the stage and just grab the cords and set up the microphones and run the cables on the stage and put up the mic stands and get the mic real good and clean the mic and, and get it ready for those singers, man, because I knew they were going to bring the Holy Ghost. And I would pray over that mic and pray over those wires. I said, God, use these worship leaders. And maybe that's why we got such a great worship team, because I valued it at that time. And I would pray. And, and, and then they graduated me. They, they saw that, you know, when nobody else showed up, I was there. You know, that, that, that you want to stand out sometimes. Come on now. You got to be the first one there and the last one to leave. And I remember when others couldn't didn't want to do some of those menial tasks. I was down. I, whatever, man. I go, man, you should have seen how I was in the world, man. I'm just grateful to be saved. And I would show up and say, OK, well, we want you to start helping with the cameras. And I was like, ooh, cameras. Let me get up on that camera. Say, oh, no, no, no. You can't touch the camera. <laughs> we saw that you're good with the cables. And so what you're going to do is you're going to come early and you're going to set up the cables. You got to be there an hour and a half early. And, and I would be there an hour and a half early. No one would be there in the church. I'd be one of the first ones there and come in and, and, and run the cables, man. And we'd run them all the way down, all the way to the back, big church, run all the cables, make sure they look clean. We had to wrap them a certain way, put them in a circle. And they showed us, they said, this is how you, these cables are $15,000 cables. You got to wrap these things correct. And I was like, okay. And I just wanted to give my talent to the Lord. And, and I wrapped the cables and then set them up and then service would start. And I was like, can I get on the camera? I was like, nope, you're going to hold the cable. And they would run around. The camera guy would run around, take on the stage. And you have these big preachers coming in, Morris Cirillo and Tim Story and Marilyn Hickey and people be preaching. And there I would be holding the cable for the camera guy. Just as he goes out, I'd give him a little bit more cable. And then he'd come in and I'd pull the cable back a little bit to make sure that he didn't trip or that the preacher didn't trip. Come on, somebody. I remember one Sunday we were there and 
we were meeting under the tent. We had 3,000 white chairs. And we, our church was exploding. And everybody had left. And, you know, that was pretty frequent. You know, some of the camera people would come in and run camera. And as soon as their camera's done, they, their service is done, they're gone. They're out with their friends eating. Right. Come on, somebody. Let's go eat. Where are we going to eat? We're, and they're, leave the camera there. And I'd say, no invite, but amen. God bless you guys. <laughs> so I'd go and unhook the camera and take down the tripod, pull out the shoe, put it in the box, make the turn everything together, start pulling in the cables. I remember one Sunday, Pastor Sonny and Julie, they were always so, such hardworking pastors, were there talking to people in the corner and taping a few things for something. For, at that time, we owned some TV stations, and they were taping some things for the TV stations that we own. And they're talking to some people, and pastor, when he gets real inspired, he gets real excited. He comes up on the keyboard, and he'll, he does not know how to play, but he'll start acting like he knows how to play. He knows a couple songs. And so he sit behind the keyboard, and he's playing some, like, altar-type sounds. And there I am over in the corner, the only person there, him and Sister Julie and just me, and I'm over there just rapping cable. <laughs> and he goes, hey, you. I go, yeah. And he's over there, and I'm over here. He goes, stand behind the pulpit. I go, huh? He goes, get behind the pulpit. Go, 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 go behind the pulpit. So I left the cable there. I got behind the pulpit, and the mic was there. He goes, pick up the mic, pick up the mic. He's playing. And I picked up the mic. And I look out and I see 3,000 empty white chairs under the tent. And he says, okay, okay. He goes, make an altar call. He goes, I'll play for you. And I was sitting there like, this is ridiculous. But then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit fell on me in that moment. And I looked out at those 3,000 empty seats. I says, at this time, I don't want anybody moving around. The Holy Spirit is in this room. Your heart is beating. That's the power of God touching you right now because God is dealing with your life. And I looked over at Pastor Sonny. He's playing. He goes, mm, come on, somebody. It was right there that I learned that your gift will make a way for you. Your gift will open up a door. Today I'm preaching because I was willing to give my time and I was willing to give my talent. And it didn't matter who saw me serving. God always saw me. God had a plan for my life. And he says, Al, you're going to be a blessing. We all have something to give. See, the way to the throne room is always through the servant's quarters. God has a way of opening, opening a door for a servant. What about your treasure? Yeah, yeah. See, as we learn to give in the small things, whether it's our time or whether it's our talent, or whether it's our treasure, because we go from level to level to level. That, that's the level we're at for some of us. Our treasure. I had, I had to learn, and I learned pretty quickly how to use my substance to help others. God had given me not a lot of money, but he'd given me something, a little substance. I, I remember I, I learned how to give when I was directing the training center and living in Bridgeport, Connecticut, we had these students and we had a traveling drama that we would take on the road to win souls. And at that time, Georgina and I were living by faith, living by faith, living as students. And let me just say living like starving students. We were a lot skinnier at the time. I was a lot skinnier at the time. <laughs> and I was making about $50 a week. We had me and Georgina and my daughter, Avery, we had to believe God. We had to believe God, just like many of us. I remember even being on EBT for a little bit, just to be able to have enough money to make it and to do the ministry. And I remember we were getting ready to go on a big trip to uh, Boston with our drama, our, the church out there, and they had this big theater. And we had this drama, and we were, we were packing up the vans, ready to drive up to Boston. And uh, Georgina says, I got to speak with you. And I said, yeah. And she says, you know, the finance girl in the office just came to me and told me that we don't have any finances. I go, what do you mean? She goes, well, everything she's given us as far as gas money for Boston and everything to get up that we're covered, but we're down to like 100 bucks. And she goes, and to top it off, a Avery needs diapers. 
And I said, okay, praise God. I go, she have enough diapers to get through this weekend? She goes, yeah, she should make it, but we, we really need a miracle. And so we went up to that drama, and we drove up there to Boston, and I'm going to take God move. We, we saw hundreds of people coming out, responding. It was a two-night drama. I remember the first night, oh, man, God moved. It was packed. The Roxy Theater packed out right there in Roxbury. But we had some guns, and they were shooting fake bullets in the drama, and it got somebody upset. So the next night, they go, we're not going to let you do this drama. We're going to cancel this drama because of the guns, and you didn't get approval, and so on and so forth. And so uh, they said, if you can do it without guns, then do it. So we stepped out to do it, and people were kind of disappointed, and the pastor really had a tough time that weekend, and it was just didn't go as planned. And I remember the next day, he goes, I'm going to take you out to eat. And usually when the pastor takes you out to eat, it's because he's going to, you know, thank you and congratulate you and, and uh, you know, and bless you. <laughs> and so I remember we went out to eat and after the meal, sure enough, he has the envelope and he has the envelope and he goes, okay, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, and he had a little church. I'm talking maybe 20 people in his church. And he goes, and I want to bless you now. And here you go. And I could see as he's put, bringing the envelope, his hand shaking. Like. <laughs> and then I grab the envelope and then my hand shaking like, <laughs> and there's this little tug of war going on between that envelope and he's shaking looking at me and I'm shaking looking at him and it was almost like a tug of war who needs this check the most and it was right there that God spoke to me says let that check go I'm your provider let it give him the check so I pulled the check from him and I had it and I started to see tears and I started sweating and I said, you know what, Pastor? I go, God just spoke to me. He says, I'm not to take this check. I, I'm to give you this check. I, 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 I go, how much is it? He goes, it's $1,000. And I was like, oh, Jesus, I've never seen $1,000 in my life. And I said, no, I'm to give you this check. I'm, I'm to give you this check. And, I, and, and you should have saw his eyes lit up. He goes, are you sure? I go, I'm positive. Here, take this check, man. Thank you for just letting us come and minister. And he took He was so happy. And we took the little bit of gas and drove home to Boston. Wouldn't you know that right when we got to Boston... The next morning, I woke up at home, and Georgina says, I got some news. I go, what? She goes, we just received a check in the mail for $10,000. That's a true story. The next day, I get a phone call from the pastor's wife from Boston. She goes, Georgina, I want to tell you something. And she goes, we just got a big donation from the city of Boston. She says, what is it? She says, it's a year's worth of diapers. I'm driving them all the way down to Bridgeport. Come on, somebody. God has a way of taking care of people who take care of his people. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verse 25, it says, The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters others will also be watered. I, I like this version. It says, The world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The third, third, third reading of Proverbs 11 says the generous will prosper and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Yes. See, understand that God does three things to those who give. First thing is he increases our heart and he increases our life. The per when you begin to give, you begin to increase personally. Yes. Do you know that giving actually personally grows your spirit and grows your heart? I, I believe this. I believe there's a real positive physical effect on a person who gives there, there's a physical effect and I've experienced it in my life many times when I've released something or I've blessed somebody there's a joy there, there, there's, there, there's even a strengthening that happens in someone's life you feel it it's personal it's powerful one day a lady gave a man a dollar and said I'm giving you this dollar because it makes me feel good and the man said well, why don't you make it a 20 and you'll really enjoy yourself <laughs> it feels good to give, church. There, there's, there, there, there's, a, there's a physical reaction when you give. And there's a prosperity that increases in our soul when we give. The word refresh means to make fresh again. Maybe you're here this morning, you just feel so 
uh, you, I don't know the word. You feel so dry. You feel so defeated. You feel so down. You feel so like, you know, you don't feel good. Wave at me. You don't feel good. You say, I just don't feel good, man. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. You know, you're, you're on that scroll all day on that phone, and it's just you're getting depressed and depressed, and you just don't feel good. Well, why don't you try something? Why don't you try giving? Why don't you try, try helping somebody? Why don't you break out of that box of depression and watch what happens to your body when you do what God tells you to do? Come on, church. Something happens to you when you begin to release. You, you become fresh again. It, it means to restore strength. It means to become animated. Look how animated I am right now. Become animated. It means, it, it means to relieve from fatigue or depression or to reinvigorate. And, and I, I preach this to maybe about 20% of you that you need a, a reinvigoration. You need to come alive as we close out this year. You weren't worshiping during worship. You weren't really getting into it. Why? Because you're going through something. Well, listen, when you help others get out of their box, your box doesn't seem so big. Your problems don't seem so big. Come on, give and do something for somebody else. The, the second thing God does is he increases our seed and he increases our supply. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, it says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way. Look at this, so that you can always be generous. So that you can always be generous. You know that God gives to those who he can give through. You know that? You know that the people who give always have enough? Why? So that they can hoard it? No, so that they can keep on blessing and keep on blessing and keep on blessing. Don't you know you're his hands and his feet to a dying world? Don't you know that you're the light to your family, the light to your loved ones, the light to your community? Never get sad when you give. He says, I'm going to give them more. He says, and when we take our gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. That's what happened. When you bless others and God uses you, they're going to start praising God. They're going to start thanking God. When we give away these cruises and these Disneyland trips and these toys, they're not going to thank Al. They're not going to thank Georgina. They're not going to even thank you. They're going to thank God. They're going to thank God that he saw their need and saw their trouble and saw their situation. But he's, they're going to thank God that he sent to people. See, God always gives and provides for those he can give through. And the more I've given church, the more I've been blessed. The more I've released, the more I've increased. How about you? See, God increases us so that we might increase others. Imagine for a moment that we are those people that he wants to use. And you know one of the ways God really uses us as I get ready to bring this in? He uses us through our weekly giving. Our weekly giving. Because we've been able to be faithful to his word and to stand upon the principle of, of tithe and offering and even giving special offerings, that's how we've been able to be a great blessing. Yes. See, there's two types of supply that we provide as a church. The first thing is we provide a spiritual supply. Yes. Say spiritual supply. Spiritual. What is that spiritual supply? That spiritual supply is the preaching of God's word. The teaching of God's word in our house fires, the counsel, the laying on of hands, the encouragement, the inspiration of how we even live. Even, do you realize that even how you live your life is an inspiration? Do you, do you realize that just how you live and how you go about your day and, and, and how you treat your family? Oh, that's an inspiration. You say, Pastor, why are you on social media? Because I want people to see how I live. And I want my life to be an inspiration to people. That's a spiritual supply. So God uses us to bring a spiritual supply to people, but then he also uses us to bring financial support. If you stick in this church long enough, you're going to see that there's going to be a year where we give a million dollars. You're not hearing me. A million dollars to global, a million dollars to national, and all that. Come on, somebody, combine to our recovery homes and discipleship. You ought to give God praise. This is not a small church. We went, came from nothing, and God has brought us into something. And I believe we ought to give it. We ought to re release it. We ought to keep on blessing people. We ought to keep on helping the hurting. Come on, church. 
Imagine there was a time when we were believing for hundreds of dollars. Personally, some of us were believing for our next meal. Some of us were believing for a car payment. He said, man, if I could just make my car payment this week, you know, believing just for diapers and Similac. Come on, somebody. Don't look at me like that. Just talking to family members and being nice to them, hoping that by the time you left, they'd give you some money. And you went from believing for hundreds to then believing for thousands. But don't you know some of those same people at one time who are believing for hundreds of dollars are now believing for millions of dollars. They're not buying one home. They're buying two homes and they're buying three homes. God has increased you greatly. And I think we got to keep on giving and keep on blessing and let the whole world know what God has done in our life. See, God is faithful to people who are in the business of doing his business. Come on, somebody. I, I, I said a long time ago, I'll preach it again one day. I want to give God everything and live on the leftovers. Because the leftovers are more than enough. See, the final thing that God does is not only does he enlarge our, our, our life and our spirit and our heart, and not only does he increase our seed and our supply, but lastly, he increases our influence. Our influence. That, that's the heart of God. He, he wants his people to have influence. He wants his church to have influence. He, he doesn't want us to stay under the radar. He doesn't want us to be hidden in a corner. He says, you're a light on a hill. I've called you to shine brightly. But when we shine, God wants us to shine with all of the blessings and all the supply and all of the resources that he's given us. He increases our influence. And in the book of Genesis chapter 26 in verse 12, Abraham's son Isaac was going to go to Egypt and the Lord spoke to him he says don't go to Egypt go down to Gerar it says and Isaac sowed in that land and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold and look at here it says and the Lord blessed him and this is the part I love in verse 13 and many of you have gotten a hold of this scripture it says the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Wrap your spirit around that. Someone say levels. No, say levels. He was obedient to God. He sowed. Look at, and the man, the man began to prosper. And then he continued prospering until he became very prosperous. And he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants so much. He became so prosperous that his enemies envied him. Wow. Imagine a God that can take us from an unenviable position. Nobody envied us. Nobody envied me when I got saved. Like, who's this guy? Nobody wants to be like him. But as I begin to activate that word in my life and God says you're going to be a blessing I want to activate that over you this morning you're going to be a blessing let me add this you're going to be a big blessing and as I started activating that word in my life and I started giving of my time and giving of my talent and then just my little treasure that I would give what did God start doing he did for me what he did for Isaac prospered more prosperous very prosperous. And you may say, this pastor, I have haters. Oh, you better believe it. Yeah. Hopefully none of you are in this room. <laughs> you, you'll get to a point where you're going to be so blessed that you move into an enviable position. And it's at that moment when God begins to increase you so greatly that you've got to keep the heart of Joseph. And you're going to say, God has done all this for a purpose. He's done this so I can shine brightly for him. He's done this so I can bless others. He's done this so that I could give him maximum glory through my life and through my talent and through my treasure. Does this get you excited? Does this stir you up? I tell you, Victor Arch, we're blessed. 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 you 
be seated for one more moment. He wants to increase us in spirit and in substance. His promise is to enlarge your seed and to enlarge your store of seed so that you can experience the God of more than ever. Some of you have not yet done that. In fact, some of you, you're still stuck at the time phase. And some of you are still stuck at the talent phase. You say, well, I give up my talent. I work hard in the ministry. But brothers and sisters, maybe that's why you're not breaking through. You haven't yet come to that part of releasing your seed to the Lord. Nobody could tell me if you only give a certain amount that you're giving the full tithe. You can't lie to me. You know why? Because I've been living here 20 years and I know that what you're giving doesn't represent your income. It doesn't represent your rent. It doesn't represent what it takes to make it in this city. In this city, you need two incomes. But when you have people that are serving in the ministry, but they don't give financially, you always could tell because they always struggle in the same area. I want to break you out of that now. It's time for you to go to another level in your leadership, in your life. You got to stop making excuses and dismissing yourself. Don't say someone else will do it. No, you need to do it. You need to be obedient to the word of God in your tithe. Don't you know that tithe doesn't even belong to you? It belongs to the Lord. In fact, everything belongs to the Lord. And I'll tell you, once you start releasing that tithe, you're going to graduate. Tell your neighbor, it's time to graduate. And then he wants to influence you in increase you in your influence but also in your authority somebody say authority you know how you get authority you know how many of you seek to have authority in your life authority in your family authority in your message authority in your leadership who would like to have authority you know where authority comes from authenticity I cannot have authority unless I'm authentic. Why, why can't I stand up here and give you this little challenge at the end? It was a good message until some of you, I'm losing you right now, but stick with me here. Why can't I come up here and challenge you and say, if you haven't given your tithe? Why? Because I practice it in my life. I just shown you how God has taken me from level to level to level. And I believe that if God has done it for me, God desires to do it for you. That's authenticity. And authenticity gives me authority. I can't speak about what I haven't experienced. I can't speak about what God hasn't done in my life. But I came to tell you on this Christmas holiday, he's been good to me. He's been faithful to me. He's provided for me. He's never let me down. That's what gives me authority. Don't you want that kind of authority? Don't you want that type of authority? Woo, my God. I'm praying for bigger authority, Leo. I'm praying for the type of authority that when I walk into banks, they start serving me food and coffee and say, what do you need, Mr. Valdez? Because I know God has given you a big vision and God is going to use you to reach the world. I'm thinking, I'm believing for bigger things. What about you? got to start trusting God in a new way. And then the last thing is increase our vision. You know, sometimes money, the size of your money will dictate the size of your vision. That, that's a reality. Sometimes we can't see past our next paycheck. We can't see past our next source of income. And I, I, I got to tell you, I lived like that for many years. My family lived like that for many years. Can't, can't do it, mijo, because the food stamps haven't gotten here yet. Can't do it, mijo, because I haven't been paid yet. When I get paid, I get paid on the 1st and 15th. Talk to me when I get paid. And I, I grew up like that, and I determined in my spirit, I said, I'm not going to live like that. I don't want to live like that no more. I'm tired of hearing no from my parents and hearing no from my family. They're always so sad and always so struggling. I said, there's got to be a door to more. I'll say it again. There's got to be a door to more. And I begin to tap in, not to the God of my salvation and not to the God of my calling. I started to tap into the God of my prosperity. And 
I said, Lord, you're bigger than a paycheck. You're bigger than a monthly income. You're bigger than a yearly income. You're bigger. You own a cattle on a thousand hill. And nothing is impossible for you. You are wonderful. And you have big blessings for me. And you said, I'm going to be a blessing. That means you're going to have to bless me. And I begin to increase my vision. The size of your vision will determine the size of your provision. Don't live your life looking at your provision. Start living your life looking at a big vision and say, God wants to do some wonderful things in my life, some wonderful things in my business, some wonderful things in my family. So, oh my God, he is wonderful church. And I've been blessed to be a blessing. I've been blessed. Seated. You're blessed. Look at your tell You are blessed. We're going to give out these four trips, but here's how we're going to do it. We're going to just, it's going to happen no matter what. It's going to happen. But what we need to do is we need to be faithful in our weekly giving. Are you hearing me? We need to go beyond that and we need to buy those toys. We only need what? I think we already have 600 toys. I bet you if you buy another few hundred, I think 400 more toys, there's probably more by now. God will probably send more. That's the God we serve. He always, he'll fund match you. He'll do it. We'll probably go over a thousand. No worry about it. We've done it so many times. All that's going to be here. But I'm worried about you. Are you going to reap this Christmas? I'm not worried about the toys. I'm not worried about the... What about you? Are you doing what's right before the Lord? Are you doing it? Some of you young people, you excuse yourself from giving. Well, I live on a me. I lived on fifty dollars. <laughs> I didn't want to go there, but I cash at people fifty bucks for meals now. I mean, it's like life can be expensive. I lived on fifty bucks a week. But I never complained. I never worried. I just did what was right before God. When God saw that I was obedient and I could be trusted. See, if God can't trust you with what you have now, don't ask him for more. Don't ask him for more. If, if he can't trust you with the tithe now, you'll never get more. He'll never give you more. That's a fact. And what I believe God is saying to us, I, I'm not worried about the toys. I'm not worried. I know it's going to happen. But I'm worried about you. I want you to grow. I want you to prosper. I want you to be blessed. I, I want some of you could be the year 20. You better be ready. Let me prophesy to you. Some of you better be ready. Within the next two years, some of you are going to be homeowners for the first time. Oh, you think I'm kidding. In the next two years, some of you are going to be homeowners in, for the first time. But you got to get a hold of this principle now. You ready to do it? Now, I can have a big emotional altar call. You come up here, shout, jump, boom, boom, boom. I like that, too. I like those services, too. But I felt, I told Georgina, said, you're going to preach the house down today. And I go, I don't think so. I, I think I'm going to inspire some people today. That's my mandate. That's my calling today. I'm going to pull some people out the financial pit. I'm going to bring you right in and usher you into a new level of financial blessing. Who's ready to go? You're coming out of poverty. You're coming out of welfare. You're coming out of week-to-week -week struggle. You're not going to have to worry about provision because God's given you a big vision. That's what's going to happen. That's my assignment this morning. Your business is going to prosper. You think you've seen it all in your business? You ain't seen nothing yet. God could take your business to a whole nother level. I want them to put the, 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 the code up. Go ahead and sit down for a minute. Put the coat up. Put the coat up there. Now, everything in our church that you want to know is all wrapped up in that code. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was telling my wife, we always put these codes up. Anything you want to know, just scan the code. Victor R. San Diego will come alive. No, I'm just kidding. But what I want you to do is I want you to pay your tithes. Bring the full 10. Do the math. Some of you, God has increased you. And without you even knowing it, you're only giving 8%. Without you even knowing it, you're only giving 9.7%.
without you even knowing it, you're only giving 9.99%. No, 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 the blessing's on the 10. So I want to encourage some of you to get the calculator out. Get it out. Am I giving the 10? And I think what you'll, you'll be shocked because see, as things grow, you lose count. See how good God is? He blesses you and, 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 and you're like, whoa, where's, where's all this windfall? That's the blessing of the Lord, brother. You need to get your calculator and you need to honor the Lord so he doesn't blow it away. He wants to trust us. So you need to really calculate your tithe. And some of you could, could begin to challenge yourself in this way. Don't, don't make excuses any longer. Even if you make, see, it's not about the amount you give. It's about whether you give the 10. That's it. So I only make 100 a week. What's 10% on 100? 10 bucks. 10 bucks. Do you know that the average gift for 75% of our church is $64? $64 a month. No, a week. I'm sorry, a week. Something like that. And as I was praying over that, I said, God, what could we do if people could bring 100? A $40 increase per person. It seems small, but together it becomes enormous. You know that we could double our church's income simply by you doing the math <laughs> on your own finances. Go to your income. Say, what have I brought in? Okay. What has God provided? And doing the math. And once you do that math, boom, you'll see it double. Heavy, huh? heavy stuff and we're at a place right now church where that small tweak look at it, it's not a before years ago it was like cranking an enormous wheel like oh no 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 it's not like that no more it's just going that much that much of a tweak in your giving will take this church into double That should get you excited. It, it could get so strong. I'm going to throw something out here. That we would, if we push the wall back, great. But it could get so strong if we would just do what's right. We would have the finances to even buy a bigger building. Yeah. Cash. We, we could imagine buy another building, have two buildings. I want to see it. I want to experience it for myself. Why? So that we can see that we, no, no, that's not the heart. Why? So that we can show others how to do it. So that we can take what we have and share it to others. That's what I'm doing with you this morning. How many of you, you're ready to give? Let me, let me see you. I want, raise your hand if you have, whether you've an envelope, if you need an envelope, ushers, wave at me. Let me see those. You, everybody should be giving. Let me see you. Well, if you're going to give, this is going to be one of the best altar calls you've ever made. It is. Now, if you don't have anything to give, then you're just... Or you do, but if you're withholding, then you're just going to stay in the same place, and that's what I don't want for you. He's too good. He's too good. He's too good. But I, I want to believe for double, man. <laughs> I want to believe for double for you. I want to believe for double for you. Do you feel my heart here? I want it bad. I want it so bad for you, but you got to want it for yourself. I want, you know, like with your kids. You want things for them. And they don't want them. So you're just grabbing them and saying, come on, dummy, you can do it. You know? But unless they want it for themselves, it never happens. That's how bad I want it for you. I look out here, I see so much potential. Greater potential than what you've already experienced. Amen?
So I want you to stand. And if, and if you have, maybe the ushers could stand up here too. Or you have an envelope? You have an envelope? Who has an envelope? Let me see. Just put it on the altar and we'll get it after. But if you've given or you're ready to give, I want it to begin to declare double over your life. And we're going to sing this song. And from all over this place, I want you to come stand at this altar. And I want us to join in our faith together. And I want to see some young people up here taking that step. And I want you to just say, Lord, I'm ready for double. Lord, I'm ready for double. I've been faithful. Tell them how faithful you've been. Lord, I've been faithful. I've been practicing your word. Even when I didn't feel like it, I was consistent every week. If you have that envelope, just throw it up here. And stay at the altar. Father, I've been faithful to you. I've been faithful in my time. I've been faithful in my talent. And I've been faithful in my treasure. And Lord, I want to experience more. I'm ready for more. Georgina, just come up here, Georgina. Come up here. Greater favor. 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 Lord, give me that favor that's on Paul. And rocks on that man. I love you guys. You guys are so beautiful. Come on. Come on. Come on.